for more than 110 years, members of Rotary International have worked to create a world where people unite and take action to benefit humanity, globally, locally, and individually. Every day, our members pour their passion, integrity, and intelligence into completing projects that have a lasting impact on individuals and cultures across our planet. Guided by the Rotary motto of service above self, our mission is to provide service to others, promote integrity, and advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through our fellowship of business, professional, and community leaders. Right? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. As science and technology increasingly influence all aspects of our existence, it is the intent of the Rotary Humanitarian Star Awards to honor and promote new scientific and technological breakthroughs that are improving and saving lives. Tonight, the Rotary Clubs of Sierra Madre and Pasadena are shining a light on the achievements of some of the outstanding individuals whose amazing accomplishments have contributed to the well-being of the human condition and are redefining our collective future. It is our pleasure and honor to present the Rotary Humanitarian Star Awards for outstanding scientific and technical accomplishments in four categories, health and medical, environmental improvement, disaster relief and recovery, and knowledge sharing. All the nominees and awardees in these four categories have significantly improved the human condition. They all exemplify the positive transformation that Rotarians have worked to accomplish for more than a century. And to tell you more about Rotary and Rotarians, it's my pleasure to introduce our Rotary District Governor. Right? I asked him how he would describe the job of District Governor, and he said, it's like being head cheerleader for 65 clubs from Pasadena to Las Vegas. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to present my fabulous friend, John Chase. Thank you. Well, I won't be leading you in a cheer tonight, but I will share a little bit about Rotary because I understand many of you may not be familiar with what Rotary International stands for. Rotary is really the premier service organization comprised of 36,293 clubs with a total of 1,211,000 as of last night, 779 Rotarians spanning the globe, all do-gooders and fun-havers. <clears throat> they are all people of action within their own communities. These individuals see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting and meaningful change across the globe, in their own communities, and it's true in themselves. Our Rotary Foundation has six areas of focus. I'll talk about each of them or I'll list them out. First is peace and conflict resolution. Second, maternal and child health. Third, disease prevention and treatment. Fourth, education, basic education and literacy. Five, economic and community development. And then lastly, water and sanitation. I'd ask that you take a moment and grab your glass of water and just enjoy a nice sip of cool, refreshing water. Because while you're doing that, you see 748 million people around the world do not have that luxury and we take it for granted oftentimes. At the end of this event, that'll be dumped down the drain if you don't consume it, so please take the time to enjoy that glass of water. 1,400 children die each day, in part due to the lack of access to clean drinking water. Luckily, that's not a concern for most of us in the United States of America. 
Ben Collins, past president of the Rotary Club of Minneapolis, Minnesota, said in 1911, he profits most who serves best. That, my friends, is a little bit about Rotary International and our commitment to service above self. Please, as you leave here tonight and you work your way through and you walk purposely throughout your day, remember to express gratitude often for the things that we have. Appreciate the little things in life that we often overlook and continue to seek opportunities to be the inspiration for all of those that you come into contact with. And speaking of gratitude, can I have the members of the committee that put this august event together please stand as we show some love for all of your work putting this together. Mary Lou. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. You're the best. By the way, you have dessert on your table, and we're not going to be mad even a little bit if you serve and pass your desserts to each other while we're talking. In addition to the wonderful volunteers who made this event happen, we wouldn't be here without the generous support of our sponsors. First and foremost, I would like to welcome our very special Polaris sponsor, Alexandria Real Estate. And I would like the representatives of Alexandria to please stand and be recognized. Thank you, thank you so very much. One, thank you so much. Next, we would like to welcome our Ride Gel sponsor, Flow Pharma. Hang on a second. See, these guys, these are the fun haver group over here. They are the very large fun haver group at the big table. Okay, now, stand and be recognized. They are do gooders and fun havers. And we have many sponsors at the Neutron and other levels. And we would not be here without each and every one of them. You see their names in your program, and you have seen their names on our slideshow. And I would like, at this point, all of our other sponsors to please stand and be recognized. Thank you, everyone. The extraordinary task of choosing each year's award recipients falls to our distinguished board of advisors, and we are deeply grateful to this year's board. Advisors, when I call your name, please stand and remain standing, and we are going to ask the audience to do their very best to hold their applause until we've recognized everyone. First. We have the general manager of NASA and Civil Space Division of the Aerospace Corporation, David A. Bearden, PhD. See, I knew it was going to be impossible. Just clap. I think you should just clap. Right? I think that's the way to go. Next, we have a professor, professor of mechanical engineering and bioengineering at Caltech and a Jet Propulsion Laboratory research scientist, Joel Burdick, PhD. Joel, stand up and say hi. Now, we have somebody that I had a very fun chat with during our cocktail hour. He is manager of early stage innovation for the Space Technology Office at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Andrew Shapiro. I also chatted with this gentleman. He's a co-founder of Materia, a founding partner at Mount Wilson Ventures, and a co-founder and current chairman of Innovate Pasadena. Please welcome Michael Giardello, PhD. And we have a retired judge of the Superior Court of the State of California, for the County of Los Angeles, the Honorable Lance A. Ito. And last but not least, the chair of our Board of Advisors, who will be joining me as your co-host tonight. She is a professor of anesthesiology at USC, 
a visiting associate at Caltech Medical and Engineering, research coordinator for the Phil Simon Clinic Tanzania Project, and a principal with Marie Chetta Consulting, Marie Chetta, MD, PhD. Thank you to all of our Board of Advisors. Wow. This is the third annual Humanitarian Star Award ceremony, and I've been honored to be the head of the review committee and your MC for all three years, and particularly honored to see the increase in these extraordinary nominations that have come before us. These are talented humanitarian scientists and talented activists. So I want to stop and say that this started at the Sierra Madre Rotary oh, Club. Madre. You got it. I mean, and, and you guys ain't very big, but you have audacious goals. And it just is amazing that the spirit of the Sierra Madre Rotary goes through all of this. Two years ago at the first event, I noted with a lot of trepidation that scientists were under siege, that data was no longer being valued as it should be in the decisions that affect all of us every day, that the deep analysis of complex data necessary to understand the systems in which we live and complex issues like climate, like new medical technologies, like the best ways to educate our students to negotiate a data-drenched world were really unappreciated and ignored. And I don't think it's gotten much better, but particularly in these times, when we find ourselves in a national funk, it's just great to see our differences and concerns set aside and agree that we can all be uplifted by an event like this where we celebrate the best among us. So it is absolutely my privilege to tell you just a little bit about the extraordinary nominees and award recipients tonight. Buckle up. You are in the presence of greatness, and I can't wait to hear what they have to say. But I want to have the slide advanced, please and tell you that the award committee has a really good eye for picking awardees. Last year, Francis Arnold was honored in the environmental improvement category. And and since that time, she's won a Nobel Prize. So now without um, Further ado, we will turn to our 2018 Rotary Humanitarian Award recipients. Thank you, Marie. Uh, so we like to say that we're the Golden Globes and the Nobel Prizes are the Oscars. <laughs> this year, for the first time, we are presenting the Helios Award, which recognizes an individual in one of our four categories who ideally exemplifies the mission and intent of these awards a person who has achieved something that is, has truly made a consequential contribution that has significantly impacted the lives of people in our country and even worldwide. Marie, please tell us about our first Helios Award recipient. So Larry Sanger, please join me. I'm going to quote from Wikipedia. Larry Sanger, a native Alaskan with a PhD in philosophy, is an American internet project developer, co-founder of Wikipedia, and founder of Citizendium. Every literate person on the planet has been touched by Wikipedia. Citizendium is a wiki for providing free knowledge where authors use their real names and invites articles on any subject sh to share their knowledge. This has the ambitious goal of developing a comprehensive compendium of knowledge. Amen. Congratulations.
Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be invited here. I didn't know what to expect at all, and um, I'm just delighted, actually. I might join the, Rotar or the Rotary Club. I've never been before. <laughs> So um, I have a kind of a, an unusual special request. I'm thinking maybe I should. OK, good. I'm, I'm going to use this one. This, is it on? Yes, allow me. I think it's, let's see here. I'm a multitasker. OK. It's like I'm a genius. Okay. It's like I'm a genius. <laughs> right. So. Um, I have a special request if uh, people who post on YouTube are here, generally in this area especially, if you could record this video and post it on YouTube, I would actually be, I'd appreciate this because I'd like the following message to, to go viral. I think it's really important. And, um, <laughs> and what better, way to, uh, to get it out there than a bunch of Rotarians, right? <laughs> so ever since I first started working on Newpedia, which was the predecessor of, of Wikipedia, um, a thought has always inspired me. It's the thought that, well, just imagine all the stunning possibilities that um, are uh, afforded when people come together as individuals to share their knowledge to create something much greater than what they could contribute individually on their own. So there is a, a general phrase describing this uh, activity, this laudable activity. It's called the sharing economy. How many people have heard of that before, the sharing economy? Excellent, OK. Something that you all should know about if you have a, a, a prize about knowledge sharing, I think. The, the motivations and rewards in the sharing economy are different when we work to benefit everyone indiscriminately. It worked well with Linux and open source software when they were first developed, and then it worked just as well with Wikipedia. So the internet actually is, uh, really needs to receive the credit. Uh, the ease of communication and publishing together with its decentralized nature, that's important, is precisely what has made the sharing economy worldwide possible. The internet is a decentralized network, right, of people working together freely for mutual benefit, very much in line with the, the Rotary Club's mission, right? About 10 years ago, all this started to change, at least from my point of view. More and more our sharing behavior has been diverted into massive private networks like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube that have exerted control and treated contributors as the product. That's not how the sharing economy is supposed to work. All you want to do, for example, is to, you know, share a picture with your family and friends. At first, we thought Facebook's handling of our private data would be just a, maybe a small, hopefully small, price to pay um, for a really powerful and useful service. But um, Facebook has, as a matter of fact, uh, recently started showing increasing contempt for our privacy, right? Started censoring more and more individuals and groups for, uh, based on their viewpoints. Now, we don't know how this is going to end. So I think we need to learn from the success of decentralized projects like Linux, open source software, Wikipedia, and the neutral technical prot protocols uh, that define the internet itself, we need to learn that we don't have to subject ourselves to the tender mercies of the internet giants. We don't have to. So how, you ask, right? Aren't they like completely dominant? Well, 
MySpace was completely dominant 10, 15 years ago, right? <laughs> the internet is made up of uh, a network of computers, right, uh, that work according to communication rules that they've all agreed upon, right? So these communication rules are called protocols and standards, right? So there are protocols and standards, for example, for displaying web pages, uh, for email, for transferring files, and for the many different technologies that undergird all of this. So these different standards, technology standards, are neutral, which means they explicitly don't care about uh, the content that they carry. Right? They don't benefit any person or any group over another. They are the result of uh, uh, the widest sort of agreement possible. So they have to be neutral. So here's the thought that I want to leave you with. You evidently support knowledge sharing because you have a category about that here, right? And knowledge sharing is so, easily, is so easy online precisely because of those uh, neutral technical protocols. So why don't we invent many more neutral technical protocols for the sharing of knowledge? We, we haven't invented that many. We should invent more. Probably the biggest reason that people are excited about blockchain, you might have heard that recently, heard about that recently, right? The, the biggest reason that people are excited about blockchain is that it is a technology and a movement that gets rid of the need of the internet giants, right? Blockchain is basically a technology that enables us to invent lots and lots of different internet protocols for pretty much everything. If you didn't know that, that's why people are so excited. So there can and there should be a protocol for tweeting without Twitter. Why should we have to rely on a company or well, one website um, uh, when all we want to do is broadcast short messages to the world, right? There sh that should be possible without Twitter. Similarly, if we want to just share tidbits of information, personal information, we should be able to agree to a protocol to share that ourselves without Facebook under our own terms. So, and although Wikipedia is, yes, an example of decentralized editing, it's still centralized, this has even become more centralized in an important way, and that is, if you want to contribute to the world's biggest collection of encyclopedia articles, you have no choice but to collaborate with and negotiate with Wikipedians, the people who write Wikipedia, right? But what if you can co-author or co-author a single-handedly uh, single a better article than Wikipedia's? It doesn't matter. Wikipedia offers you no way to get your work in front of its readers. You have to negotiate with them. So, again, there should be a neutral encyclopedia protocol an internet for encyclopedias, basically. One that en enables us to add encyclopedia articles to a shared database that its creators own and develop, just like the internet itself. Right? That's why I'm working on Everipedia, which is uh, building a blockchain encyclopedia. That's why I'm supporting all kinds of other blockchain projects that are creating lots of different new neutral protocols that will basically disintermediate all kinds of relationships that we have with each other. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay, you have set the bar very, very high. Right? I think Dr. Merkin is breaking out in a little bit of a sweat down here. Um, one of the most significant ways a person can improve the human condition is through the field of medical science. For example, vaccines are changing the health landscape throughout the world. 
Rotor International is dedicated to the eradication of polio, and it is this close to its goal with only a handful of cases this year worldwide in only two countries. <laughs> Health and medical discoveries are allowing medicines to reach remote areas of the planet. Severe birth defects and diseases are being corrected and cured. Hearts are being healed, and lifespans are increasing along with significantly improved quality of life. Our Health and Medical Award recognizes consequential medical achievements which have been applied for significant humanitarian benefit. Marie, I understand this is your area of expertise. Please tell us more about our 2018 Health and Medical nominees. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each nominee, and please hold your applause until we get through this, otherwise we'll be here all night. And I will try very hard to give you a sense of the diversity of science um, in relatively lay language. If you are uh, present, please stand up, um, and then we will in each category have the award winner come to the stage. So the nominees in Health and Medical are Matthew Becker, nominated by Yutan Getzler. Matthew is the Gerald Austin Endowed Chair in the College of Polymer Sciences and Polymer Engineering, recognized for amino acid-based polyester ureas for use in regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is my field. In other words, if you put a stem cell into something, you can't expect it to do something without instruction. So Matthew makes the kinds of polymers that cause the cells to stay in place and instructs them from the surrounding environment to function. These materials will be used to advance healing in a variety of disease processes, such as fractures. Our next Nominee, Dr. Diane Cullinane, who I believe is here. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, nominated by Judith Wilson, is the Executive Director of Professional Child Development Associates here in Pasadena. She's a pediatrician specializing in neurodevelopmental disabilities. She developed specialized ways to deliver medical care to children with autism and other similar dis disabilities and to teach their families how to use her methods to support healthy emotional and cognitive function. The Professional Child Development Associates, led by Dr. Cullinane, reaches more than hundreds of children each week in LA using her therapeutic framework. The third nominee, Dr. John Finn, is Professor of Radiology, Medicine, and Biomedical Physics at UCLA and has made particular contributions to the field of cardiovascular MRI. What struck his nom nominator was that he's made methods that are useful for high resolution imaging of the heart in very, very young neonates who can't hold their breath like adults when their hearts are being imaged in the MRI scanner. This allows surgeons to better prepare for the correction of congenital heart disease. Our next nominee, this is the largest category. Our next nominee is Dr. Amir Kashani, assistant professor at USC's Roski Eye Institute, nominated by Paul Martin, standing here on the stage, for his clinical contribution to one of the pioneering teams that developed stem cell therapies to treat macular degeneration, one of the major contributors to the loss of quality of life in the elderly. Our next nominee, I believe, is here, uh, Dr. Alastair McDowell of Caltech, has made important contributions that all scientists who work in the lab like I do um, use every day. While a, still a doctoral student, he made seminal contributions at the University of Paris, figuring out ways to prepare cells, a process called vitrification, that made it possible to use cryo-electron microscopy so that you could look at frozen molecules at the anatomic level and visualize them. His discovery was essential to the award of a Nobel Prize to, um, to the leaders of the lab in which he worked. 
please. Dr. Pablo Moscato, nominated by Scott Carter, um, is currently a professor at the University of Newcastle in Australia. He's not with us tonight. Recognized for development of innovative mathematical models and computer algorithms called mimetic algorithms that he applied to the discovery of challenging problems in biology and medicine. He is determined to see medicine transformed by computer science. These algorithms are now being used to find early biomarkers of complex disease processes such as Alzheimer's. Dr. Sumner Norman, I know, is here. Please stand. It's, it's really great to see a young, young scientist acknowledged as well because people are inspired by their work even though they're very young in their careers. Um, Dr. Norman was nominated by Jeremy Emkin. He's an engineer and a postdoc at Caltech working on the brain-machine interface using technologies to help patients recover function after spinal cord injury and stroke. This is astonishing work. He was a public impact distinguished fellow as a student at UCI and something that I think speaks to his willingness to educate a lay public, a writer and editor for NPR's The Lowdown in Science, which is a locally great program. And while I was um, talking with him before, he also mentioned that he's develop, developed a micro ultrasound method that really um, allows better visualization of the processes that are used in the brain machine interface. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Catherine Willeman is founder and CEO of the Familial Hypercholesterol Foundation. I believe Catherine is here as well. Um, a very misunderstood disease. After suffering a heart attack at the age of 38, rather than focus inward, she went out. And she founded an organization that educates broadly about this disease and brings patients together with appropriate clinical trials. The FH Foundation website is really one of the best uh, patient advocacy websites I have ever seen, both for physicians and for patients. And, oh, Dr. Kashani, please stand up. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and I will ask uh, Professor Chad Merkin to come to the stage from Northwestern University. Professor Merkin is the recipient over 130 national and international awards and is the director of the International Institute for Nanotechnology at Northwestern. This is a remarkably versatile chemist and he was the first chemist, this is incredible, elected to all three branches of our national academies. The National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine. There aren't many people like that. <laughs> He's incredibly prolific, and there are many discoveries that should be recognized, but, but his nominator was particularly struck by one discovery, and so tonight he is recognized for his work in spherical nucleic acids, you thought they were just double helices, and their application to medical diagnostics and therapies. Please welcome the most cited nanomedicine researcher in the world, who continues to make humanitarian contributions by applying these technologies to medical diagnostics and personalized therapies. Great, it's a, it's a, a real pleasure to be here, and I mean that in, uh, in many different ways. Uh, I came in from Chicago, so I was in the polar vortex. <laughs> and I, I don't know if you've experienced a polar vortex, but uh, that was my first, and I hope it's my last. Uh, I got to the airport, and it was minus 49. I got on the plane, it was 25 degrees, on the plane. We couldn't get enough fuel because the fuel was so viscous, it couldn't be pumped, and we just had enough fuel to get to Denver. That's the only reason I'm here. 
They stopped in Denver to refuel, an unanticipated stop so that I could make it here. I thought I was coming to great weather. I was a little disappointed with the rain. <laughs> Uh, but I knew I was going to come and, and meet a lot of do-gooders and uh, have funners, and, and uh, that has not disappointed. Um, this is actually not my first time to the Rotary. I, I, I won a Good Citizenship Award when I was 12 years old. So, I, I, I feel like I'm back with friends. Um, I also have a friend um, named Jeff Martin uh, back in Wilmette who, who has just been a huge proponent of the Rotary, a member for quite some time, and he's, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from him about it, and, and but one of the things that really struck me was just the extraordinary commitment this group has to helping people. And the one area that, that I was really amazed with was what we heard in the introduction, um, the, the commitment to polio and exterminating or getting, eradicating polio. <laughs> billions of dollars going towards uh, a big problem, a problem that affects so many people around the world and so close to wiping it out. Um, we're also trying to impact uh, medicine and vaccine development in my research group at Northwestern. So there are a lot of commonalities there. But we're doing it a different way, a new way. And I want to tell you a little bit about that technology because I think you're going to hear a lot about that in the years to come. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to affect everybody in this room. It's using concepts from chemistry and nanotechnology to advance the fields of biology and medicine. And one of the best examples, I think, are these spherical nucleic acids. They were invented in my group about 20 years ago. Uh, really just a basic research type exercise. We weren't trying to develop medicines. We were trying to understand how we could tag nanoparticles with DNA and effectively create programmable atoms. Or you could think of DNA as a programmable bond that was latched onto a particle and then you could use that to assemble those particles into all sorts of functional materials. Um, these SNAs are a beautiful convergence of chemistry and nanotechnology uh, to restructure and repurpose the blueprint of life. They're made by taking a, a tiny particle, and the way I like to think about it is if you, if you look, think of a cush ball, many of you have had children that play with these or you've seen them around, this is a great model of a spherical nucleic acid. So the core is essentially the nanoparticle, and the little snippets of DNA are the hairs that come out of it. So we're effectively taking what we heard the duplex and, and rearranging it in this spherical form. Uh, if you shrink this 100,000 times, that's a spherical nucleic acid. So a tiny structure that looks like this, and a structure that had never been made before, but one that interacts with living systems in really unusual ways. So why is this important? When one reshapes DNA in this manner, it takes on new properties. Making such structures extremely use useful as sensitive labels for binding genetic signatures for disease. So you can kind of think of this as a, a Velcro ball, a specific Velcro ball that can latch on the genetic signatures because it can put different sequences that recognize sequences unique to bacterial, viral infections. Um, today, if you have a bloodstream infection, C. diff, or flu, and get tested at a hospital, there's a good chance that you'll be diagnosed with this technology. Hundreds of thousands of tests are being run each year based upon these particle probes, and, and both improving and in certain cases saving lives. And that's going to continue to grow because these are one of the most powerful ways of diagnosing disease at the point of care. But what's even more exciting is that this cush ball like structure can be used to create powerful medicines for deadly diseases like GBM, glioblastoma multiforme, a lethal form of brain cancer, spinal muscular atrophy, a genetic disease that affects young children and usually keeps them from living past the age of kindergarten. In many forms of cancer, in addition to debilitating conditions like psoriasis, irritable bowel disease, and we've already heard about macular degeneration. The reason they're so powerful is that they can get into organs and tissues that conventional linear DNA and RNA can't access. Finally, getting back to the vaccines, they can be loaded with the components of vaccines and introduced into your immune system to create powerful new immunotherapies and vaccines for many types of cancers. And this isn't pie in the sky type stuff. There are now four drugs based upon SNAs that are in human clinical trials, mostly by an exciting found, a, a company that I founded called Exacure. Here the SNAs not only are more potent, but can be systematically developed and changed to work for different patient populations. So imagine having vaccines and, and therapies that you can modulate 
not only for disease, but for different subpopulations because people react in different ways. The genetic content stored in here and the components that can be placed in here allow you to do that. And someday soon, uh, this is going to open up a field that we like to refer to as rational vaccinology, where required vaccine components can be taken off the shelf and put together in spherical nucleic acid form to create potent and selective vaccines for many conditions. In closing, I want to acknowledge the tremendous student researchers and collaborators who have paved the way for this important set of discoveries. I've had a massive group, fortunate to have lots of funding throughout my entire career, but the, we were talking about this earlier. The incredible thing is it acts as a magnet to bring amazing people from all over the world that want to engage in this type of research and make these types of discoveries. It is a group effort. And then also the, uh, the dedicated researchers at Execure, the company that's really translated this. Um, we take it as a major compliment and honor that the Rotary has called out this work for a Star Award, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>
So I will say, each University of California campus chooses one individual as their climate champ champion. This is she. For their work helping to achieve carbon neutrality. Dr. Oskin's patented battery technologies take abundant, usually wasted resources and turn them inter into energy, a desperately needed paradigm shifting technology to preserve the quality of human life on this planet. Commercial offshoots of this technology are planned to stay local, affording technical job opportunities in the Inland Empire. She also invented an award-winning sponge suit that cleans the ocean as you swim in it. She's a highly decorated, I would call her teacher warrior mentor, especially for young women aiming for careers in science and engineering. Dr. Oscar. <laughs> my glasses. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Uh, guests in this room, and I have uh, a lot in common, believe it or not. Our DNA uses the same uh, for letter alphabet, A, C, G, T. And 99% of elements in our body comes from the exploded stars. Over the history of our galaxy, about 200 million stars exploded, and at the Big Bang, three elements uh, were formed, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. The rest of elements are coming from star explosions, which makes us. Therefore, we are all stardust. Furthermore, we live on the same blue planet. If we look at today, planet's surface temperature increased about two degrees Fahrenheit since 19th century, and ocean surface temperature increased 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit since 19th century. The year 2016 is noted as the warmest year on record. Greenland lost 281 billion tons of ice per year, and Antarctica lost 119 billion tons. Global sea level rose eight inches since 1880, and oceans are 30% more acidic, and many coral reefs across the globe are bleached. The global conveyor belt across oceans that slowly moves around the world, taking 1,000 years to make a complete turn. The melting of ice caused by global warming may weaken the global conveyor belt by adding extra fresh water. Ironically, just like you know, Chicago, our friend uh, coming from Chicago experienced, despite an overall increase in global temperatures, many places in North America, Europe may get colder as a result. So the question is, what is really warming the world? Is it the Earth's orbit? The Earth wobbles on its axis, and its tilt and orbit change over many thousands of years, pushing the climate into and out of ice ages. Yet the influence of orbital changes on the planet's temperature over 125 years has been negligible. Is it the sun? The sun's temperature varies over decades and centuries, and these changes have had little effect on Earth's overall climate. Is it volcanoes? Collective data suggests no. Human industry emits about 100 times more carbon dioxide than volcanic activity, and eruptions release surface chemicals that can actually cool the atmosphere for a year or two. If you put all three natural factors together, it just doesn't add up. It turns out that the human factor is the source of this problem, industrialization. Putting the possible natural and human causes of climate change alongside one another makes the dominant role of greenhouse gases even more plainly visible. The only question, the real question is, what are we going to do about it? 65% of global greenhouse gas emission is measured as carbon dioxide. 
Today, there are 408 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and this is highest in 35 million years. In California, 41% of carbon dioxide is from transportation alone. In order to minimize and eliminate carbon emission from cars in UC Riverside, we choose to develop advanced battery technologies using renewable material sources, including portobello mushrooms, beet sand, and waste glass. We lowered the cost of batteries by 30% and improved their performance up to two times better than Tesla's Panasonic batteries today. Our work was even featured at the Conan O'Brien show, and Conan said, engineers at UCR have created a lit lithium ion battery using portobello mushrooms, and they come up with the idea while using a different kind of mushroom. <laughs> and I would like to address Conan's statement in public today. Conan, no. We did not use a different kind of mushroom. Instead, we explored the micro and nanostructure of the portobello mushroom, which has an ideal microstructure. I am an ambassador for better future of our planet and advocate of sustainable and green energy technologies. As a climate champion professor of the University of California, I have been giving lectures on environment and climate at worldwide. To increase the awareness on these important topics, the challenges of our century, I am also giving public presentations nationwide. University of California also named me as change maker professor. I train entrepreneurs and create people to take decisive actions so they can get their greatest work into the world. Tonight, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Rotary Award Selection Committee for the Humanitarian Star Award, recognizing my passion and efforts on environmental improvement using science and technology. I am an amateur art acrostic poet, and I write poems related to climate change and environment to raise global awareness. I post them on my public Instagram account. And I would like to finish my talk by reading one of my latest poem named Blowing in the Wind, inspired by Bob Dylan. If you can have, yeah. So there is a blowing in the wind, lonely blue planet on the path for change. Wind has the answer inside, search and find. And how many words will it take? It's before washed to the sea. Now find the answer, my friend. The answer is blowing in the wind. Home, the bl blue planet entered in a wrong path, wind has the answer, inside, search and find. Now act timely before destroying my home. Thank you very much. It's possible that I might have goosebumps right now. <laughs> Natural disasters demand immediate response and long-term relief and recovery. The Rotary Humanitarian Star Award for Disaster Relief and Recovery honors achievements in saving and restoring lives under these most challenging of circumstances. Marie, take it away. The first nominee is Dr. John Butler. He's an expert in DNA typing in the context of forensic science. His books are used all over the world to train and assist criminal justice departments to identify victims of mass casualty disasters 
including in places like the World Trade Center and war victims in Yugoslavia, using techniques that he developed. His STR base is an open resource for genomic data to assist investigations worldwide. Dr. Tim McMahon works in a related field and has developed gene sequencing and identification tools for identi identification of human remains from his position in the Department of Defense. In the AF, MES, AF DIL lab, it is the only DOD DNA testing lab. His work has helped to bring closure to families of victims of terrorism. Catherine Cat Trujillo is a lawyer, but she's deputy director of Libraries Without Borders, committed to expanding access to life-saving information and services, again, around the world. Her pop-up libraries and maker spaces in places as diverse as the Bronx, Detroit, and recently Puerto Rico, are used to help recovering communities by teaching new skills, developing new technologies in the context of this makerspace, and to help res resilience from the next disaster. The space is really a community with the goal of service now of over 1,000 families in Puerto Rico by the end of this year. Our award recipient unfortunately could not be here. Yesterday she had a death in her family. Maria Velasco of Puerto Rico was inspired by the enormous need imposed upon the island by Hurricane Maria. This Maria put her entrepreneurship and creativity skills to work by leading a company called Hivecube. She makes safe, sustainable, sturdy to hurricane, solar-powered homes from shipping containers. The homes can be easily transported. They're compliant with every building code and affordable. These homes really represent dignity for those who have had everything taken from them and are a sustainable way to prevent further hurricane homelessness. Please award Maria with your applause. <laughs> And of course, that shiny object will be winging its way to Puerto Rico first thing in the morning. Yay. And we come full circle to knowledge sharing. We started with our Helios Award winner, who is a knowledge sharer. And again, it is only by the effective dissemination of knowledge to the people who need it most that a person's work becomes of true benefit to humanity. Our award for knowledge sharing recognizes the individuals or teams who have, through scientific or technological discoveries, significantly improved our ability to share knowledge for human benefit, or who have made knowledge of scientific or technological advances available in order to improve or save lives. We are particularly thrilled because our award recipient in this category is a fellow Rotarian. <laughs> and Marie is going to tell you all about the nominees and introduce our award recipient. Before I do that, I want to remind you that the nominations for next year's awards will open right away. Spread the word. Have the video of this program shown wherever you can. And think about the people in your lives, distant or close, who could be recognized next year. The first knowledge sharing nominee is Alki Flagen, who is here. <laughs> Nominated by Angie Gomez, who I think should also stand and, and is here. This remarkable woman teaches science at Ramona College, uh, the College of the Canyons, and at PCC. She's developed a curriculum, Robotic Education to Improve Lives. She, she reaches out to disadvantaged students, particularly to expose them to STEM, 
and encourage them to pass their knowledge on to their younger peers. She's the mentor of one of the first winning all-female competitive robotics teams. <laughs> Dr. Maria Pan Jawaharlal, professor of mechanical engineering at Cal Poly Pomona, is an energetic educator of people of all ages and has supervised over 360 senior projects, which I can't imagine. Um, he's developed new courses, new ways to teach here and abroad, including places like China, and is the director of the Center for Community Learning Services and the co-founder of Feminir, inspiring girls to fearlessly enter a career in engineering and teachers to execute that program. Dr. Melanie Rebeck, is the CEO and co-founder of Radically Open Security, the world's first nonprofit computer security consultancy. This company sends 90% of its fees to a foundation that in turn supports open source internet research, coming back to our first awardee, and digital rights organizations. She has shown, really for the first time in this area, that nonprofit enterprises can make an impact in a very profit-driven industry and empower people and organizations that could otherwise not access these services. Dr. Catherine Roberts is the Director of Graduate Program in Criminalistics and the developer of its curriculum at uh, Cal State LA. She was recognized by LA police and sheriff's departments who have lauded her teaching methods and the preparation of students to work with them in the field with a remarkable skill set that keeps us all safer. She's a tireless educator, overseeing workshops and symposia all over the place and publishes extensively to enhance the ethical practice of forensic science. Dr. Jerry Schubel, nominated by Bill Patzert. Bill, you should stand. <laughs> Uh, is the president and CEO of the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. He has redefined the role of the modern aquarium, taking the lead in using arts and technology to make ocean science so critical to the future of this planet, an engaging and relevant issue for the public. The aquarium has provided environmental education to over 30 million visitors and has a substantial reach nationwide through its aquatic forum, where he brings thought leaders together to find solutions to controversial and complex environmental issues. Dr. Chess Stetson is CEO of DRISC, also called 42 Interactive, is a leader in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning applied to healthcare diagnostics and understanding the brain. This amazing person trained at Harvard, then at Caltech, and has worked in major medical institutions, the Lincoln Lab at MIT, and the Smithsonian Observatory. The AI tools he developed have applications across healthcare, but also widely used in computational chemistry and in finance. Our last awardee, please work your way to the table, is James Jim Margraff, nominated by Claire Roberts. <laughs> so this inventor, Rotarian, serial entrepreneur, author, and inspiring speaker is probably best known to parents through the LeapPad learning system. This wonderful educational tool is emblematic of the panoply of inventions that contribute to lifelong learning out of the hands of this man. He's a tireless and passionate champion of causes that elevate the human condition, reaching millions with his technologies and energy. Thank you. She will be beaten if you teach her that. I heard these words and cringed. I felt tears in my eyes. It was 2004. 
My team and I were working to transform a device I had invented to teach reading called the LeapFrog LeapPad into a low-cost platform to help educate non-literate women in Afghanistan. LeapFrog, of which I was a co-founder, had been contacted by the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, who had seen our LeapPad. I'd created the LeapPad in 1998, and by 2004, this tool had helped 100 million children around the world learn to read. It quickly became the number one selling toy in the U.S., above Barbie dolls and Hot Wheels and Razor scooters, landing in about 77% of households with kids from ages to four and seven. Secretary Thompson had asked us to make a custom leap pad that would speak in Dari and Pashto, not to help educate children, but to help non-literate women and mothers in Afghanistan. In 2004, more than 80% of Afghan women were non-literate due to restrictions by the Taliban. If a husband were to find a woman learning certain information from our leap pad, he would beat her. To address Secret Secretary Thompson's request, I began researching oral cultures. I led our team to adopt a new mindset in interactive learning for non-literate adults. We began from scratch, discarding our thinking and the biases around the leap pad interaction models we had so painstakingly crafted for literate children. We carefully defined our PTS, our problem to solve and collected data and defined metrics to teach Afghan women about sanitation, nutrition, depression, pregnancy, immunization. We researched oral and literate cultures, beginning with the findings of Dr. Walter Ong in his book, Orality and Literacy. Ong postulated that literacy and writing restructure human consciousness. Learning to read and write fundamentally changed the way we think. I wondered, what would it feel like to have never seen writing or text such as was the case for many Afghan women. How could we teach these women with our leap pad? How would they respond when they touched a pen to paper and they heard words? For an oral learner, there's nothing like the written word. Spoken words are transient. By the time a word has been spoken, it has already passed out of existence. So the idea of looking up a word in a dictionary has no meaning to an oral learner. Further, an oral communicator doesn't think or speak in terms of ideas and concepts or abstractions. Rather, thought is in terms of experiences. This concept itself is difficult for us as literates to even understand. Our brains have been rewired with literacy to achieve a higher plane of thought and a different consciousness. For example, a literate thinker might say honesty is the best policy both abstract terms, while an oral thinker would say, the honest man always prospers. The phrases honest man and always prospers depict concrete situations that can be envisioned by a listener versus the abstract concepts of honesty and prosperity. So in my speaking to you now, I've assembled my thoughts solely based upon having become literate, which has allowed me to create the abstractions necessary for me to build an outline for a speech and to structure my thoughts as expository text. So, to teach Afghan non-literate women, we created interactive stories. Getting a woman to touch a picture of a person, then another, then another, then another, and listen to them speak to one another. Our PTS, problem to solve, included teaching mothers to use boiling water to sterilize, to eat carrots to reduce night blindness, and to accept vaccinations to prevent disease. We shipped 20,000 of these Afghan leap pads to health clinics in Afghanistan where women could use them safely without fear of violence. Each Afghan leap pad cost a mere $7 to manufacture. That was 15 years ago. Smartphones and tablets didn't even exist then, nor did virtual reality or artificial intelligence. So over the past 30 years, I've founded or co-founded a half dozen companies with inventions that apply technology to advance literacy, learning and thinking. In addition to the leap pad, my company's inventions have included an interactive globe to address geographic illiteracy, a smart pen at Livescribe that makes a digital copy of your notes when you write with synchronized audio. And more recently, I founded iFluence to transform intent into action through your eyes by looking, to advance human intelligence and collaboration in virtual reality and augmented reality, or VR and AR. Google purchased iFluence in 2016, which led me to connect Google with Rotary for virtual reality 
and I drove the development of the VR experience that debuted in Atlanta in 2017 called One Small Act. So as Rotarians, our strength is our passion and commitment, our volunteerism, our independence, and also our potential for synergy with one another. We're strongest when we come together, as we have done here tonight and can do now freely with technology. We will drive illiteracy and ignorance into the past just as we are making polio but a memory. And we will create the future for ourselves, our families, and their families that befits the honor and privilege it is to be a Rotarian in today's world. So I thank the Sierra Madre and Pasadena Rotary Club and you all. And uh, my hometown, Lafayette, and the Marinda Sunrise Club. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask all of our awardees, not so fast, Jim, I would like to ask all of our awardees to bring your trophies and come back up here um, for one photo op. Uh, I know what some of you are wondering about this mystery man. The Golden Globes has a beautiful woman. Um, we have an extraordinary man who is both a Rotarian and a scientist, Dr. Paul Martin. Thank you for being our Golden Globes girl. Um, I would... I would also like, winners, what are you waiting for? Come up here and bring your trophies. Um, I would, while they're doing that, I would like to recognize our event co-chairs, Eric Dysart from the Pasadena Rotary Club. Stand up, Eric. And Joan Reback from the Sierra Madre Rotary Club. You're the super best. You guys are amazing. Um, and thanks to everybody who made this all possible. Our friends at the University Club, you are amazing. You did it again. Um, I would like to invite our nominees, our nominators, our awardees, board of advisors and sponsors to please st stay around for a little while. We're gonna have champagne back at the bar and pictures and maybe there might be some hugging. I don't know, I can't even say. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening and showing your support. For these amazing people, amazing. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Please drive carefully. You all are the best. Thank you.